everybody. Happy, well, happy new year to you and very good morning. Um, it's 8.30 over there. So um, as I've just said, I very much appreciate you logging in early to today's date just to um, contribute and, and be a guest on our podcast today. So a massive hello and a massive thank you. Hello, and I'm so happy to be here. Um, good, good. Well, that's always a good start, isn't it? Um, <laughs> So Molly, it was probably about a year ago uh, that we just, well, I discovered you and and the work that you've been leading um, partially became because I came across this article about you being, I mean, what a line. Forbes is top 30 under 30. That's, that's no small feat. Um, and you were basically spotlighted as one to watch. So for those listeners who were obviously not paying attention and um, aren't in the know, can you tell us? who you are and and what what is it that you do, Molly? Sure. I'm Molly Truth. I am the master distiller at Freeland Spirits. Um, that means that I get to make really cool products that people get to enjoy. Uh, we mostly focus on gin, but we like to consider a, ourselves a gin distillery with a whiskey problem. Um, the problem is we really <laughs> like whiskey. <laughs> and um, we currently have three gins that we um, produce and two whiskeys, a bourbon and a rye. Um, and every once in a while, we'll throw in a canned cocktail to the mix. <laughs> like it. I like it a lot. Well, we're going to delve into that a little bit more. Um, but um, just sticking with you and, and your journey a little bit, I feel like you know, we've talked to quite a few different um, distilleries and uh, managing directors and owners of those distilleries. But I believe you are probably our first that almost straddles a couple of roles as a partner of, of Freeling Spirits, but equally as a, as a master distiller. Um, so has, a, a, I think, an interesting perspective on the, the love and the passion you've brought to the flavor and how that actually comes through into the bottle doing it justice. So I'm really um, keen to get stuck in. But before you do, how does this world get entered? How do you become <laughs> a distiller? It, you know, there's so many different pathways. Um, I happen to start very young in my career and spirits. Um around 23, which in the United States means, you know, you have two years to actually legally imbibe before you start your career. Um, and, but I, I really loved chemistry. And so I was going to my undergrad program in Oregon, uh, earning a degree in chemistry with an emphasis in forensics. And I thought I was going to do forensics. I was really excited to get in a lab and, you know, help solve crimes. Uh, and then I realized that that was a part of chemistry I really did not like. I did not gravitate towards the analytical side and obviously when you're solving crimes you have to do things a very standard way all the time mm, yeah and i had the realization that i was a much more creative person than that and i wanted to do something more creative with chemistry but i of course you know what that is who knows mm. and i started doing soul searching or as i like to call it the thinking and drinking phase of <laughs> where do, where do i want my Sounds life like to a go really fun phase <laughs> it was pretty great. And, you know, you, you just open yourself up to all these opportunities. And then I had a friend who was doing the UC Davis Brewing Program. And I was chatting with her. And I had never really thought about what that meant and that that was something that you could do. And so I started looking at it more. And I was lucky to find a master's program in Scotland that was uh, just a year-long program. Um, at Harriet Watt University, and I applied, and I think within a month I learned I got in, and I had to graduate first, but I slowly started packing my bags, um, and then I spent a year in Scotland learning how to make beer and spirits, and came back to Oregon where I'm from, and I've been lucky to be in the industry ever since, which is um, I think we're a decade plus at this point. Yeah, absolutely. So it's not a quintessential approach to um, um, becoming a distiller, but certainly that chemistry must be coming to play in, in of sorts um, to the skills that you've done. But a, a massive shout out because I'm also a Harriet Watt University undergrad uh, graduate. So I'm just going to give them a little shout out that we're very proud of you. And uh, thank you for creating what is in front of us today. Of course. <laughs> Um, so Forbes obviously caught hold of you, um, especially in the food and drink section. They um, noticed you. Yeah, it was it was very interesting, very surreal moment. You know, there's an interview process, so I knew that there was a potential. But, you know, they just kind of popped the news at 5.30 a.m. our time. And I was like, I woke up and re saw the email and I was like, what? And 
um, it was just one of those things that you never really anticipate. Um, you know, you, you don't, you don't set goals around things, you know, are not in your control is how I've always approached goal setting. And just having that happen was something I completely unexpected. Did it feel like a lot more pressure was on you all of a sudden? No, you know, strangely enough, I didn't feel a lot of um, pressure. Um, I got, it was this weird thing where I, people just started saying like, congratulations, you've made it. And I was like, well, I, oh, I don't feel like I've made it, <laughs> but you know, I'm, I'm making it, I'm making something. And I take a lot of pride in like the products that um, I make. I think they keep me grounded as well because they're always, you know, there's always so much to learn and so much to, um, to work on. So that's kind of how I've viewed it. Yeah. And, and certainly the path that you've taken has, um, has proven to be bountiful because you are now at Freeland Spirits um, and Freeland Spirits uh, is known for being women owned, operated, distilled. And from our last conversation, you're also looking to source um, from women led enterprises and, and organizations. So this is a this is a bold statement, I think, and, and obviously something I um, very much resonate with. How did that come to be particularly important for Freeland Spirits? It's part of our original plan. Um, so I I was introduced to the concept of Freeland um, about two years before we actually got started. And uh, I met Jill, who's the founder and CEO. And uh, we I was working on a different distillery. And we um, realized we shared a common love of gin and rye whiskey. And we started talking more and more. And one of the things that I mean, there's a lot of people who want to start distillery, so it might not happen for them. And when I met Jill, I realized that it was going to happen. What what she said was going to happen was going to be true. And um, so I just kind of followed along for the two years it took to actually get Freeland started. And in that time, I just fell more and more in love with what she was trying to achieve. And completely like you, it resonated deeply with me. Um, and... That was just part of the original goal was to um, have women in leadership positions. And that's a very broad statement. There's a lot of ways that you can be a leader in a while running a distillery. Um, but we have a, a woman CEO, a woman master distiller. Uh, most of our management team is women as well. And um, we have also had the fortunate ability with, uh, you know, our local farmers to find women um, to farm for us, to help us with like um, our our flagship product, our gen has cucumbers in it. And we're able to find, find a woman cucumber farmer who, you know, we're, I think we're her largest customer, her largest single customer. And uh, I mean, that's a great feeling. And the same with our, our grain, it's a um, husband wife team. And um, we're one of their largest customers as well. They work with a lot more bakeries and they do distilleries. And of course, bakeries get, you know, it's pretty much one to one when you're working with grain and that's not how it works with spirits. So we we need a lot of volume to make a small amount of whiskey. And that happens to mean that we're one of their largest customers, if not the largest. That's incredible. And and I think it, uh, most of the suppliers are from the locality, aren't they? They're from Portland or from the Oregon um, state. Is, is that right? Correct. We try to source as many things as local as possible. Um, and we have worked with, um, like two of our predominant gens. We have Freeland gen and we have forest gen. Um, we're working with either garden fresh for gen or forest fresh for the forest. And those all come as close as possible to the distillery itself. That's, that's fantastic. So you started from becoming an idea to now creating a, a, an ecosystem effectively in the area where you're, you're really supporting and supplying for the network, which is which is fantastic. Um, I mean, we, we talked about a little bit about how you've come to play and, and we've talked about it, it started with an idea and, and, and a passion, but at the time, the role of, uh, uh, I mean, we could talk about the role of genders and leadership roles across different dynamics and we could probably talk about it forever, but perhaps we'll save that for another podcast, guys. Um, <laughs> but for this one, for 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 this podcast in this industry, I can imagine at the time the role or the gender dynamic was quite in terms of distillers was quite limited. Would you say definitely imbalanced? Definitely. Um, I when I first started too, I I worked mostly just 
with men. And, you know, that was my experience. And sometimes that was great. And sometimes it was a challenge. Um, and right when we were getting started, um, you know, there was the start to a shift. And there were a lot more opportunities as women to get highlighted. You know, some of it became fashionable. And you're seeing more and more articles about uh, women who are doing great things in that industry. Um, which I think with anything, you know, seeing women do something, you're suddenly like, oh, there are women. And there there are people like me out there doing the same thing. And so it, like for myself, that was just the point where I was like, oh, there are people I can reach out to, people for mentorship, people who I can at least have a, might be going through something very similar. And um, it really felt like since that moment, it's just kind of snowballed. There's um, a lot more chances to network as a woman with with other women who are doing uh, similar roles and really learn from each other and hear each other and support each other. Um, and I definitely when I started, didn't feel like that was there was opportunities to do that, such such things. And so it's really fun to kind of um, be a part of that and to also like my, one of my goals starting um with freeland was knowing that it, it might be more of a a role that would highlight me right my goal with that more than anything is if someone reaches out and they were like oh we lo we love what you do we're in we're doing something very similar is to advocate for them and to mentor if that's you know needed but more than anything just talk and make a friend and support and be a, a voice for someone where I didn't always necessarily feel like I had the same voice when I started. That's amazing. And that, and I think that does well for representation and, and it does amazing things for, for um, supporting um, women in the industry. But I think there's probably a general takeaway that that's, it's a support network in this industry in general. Um, I, I mean, I follow you on LinkedIn and I encourage other people to, to follow Molly um, because you share some really great content. And that, and that what your message is in terms of support comes through in, uh, in LinkedIn. So Freelance Spirit has kind of developed this, this co core ethos, I would say. It's quite fundamental to the brand. Would you say that that's probably its main differentiator in the market? Yes, I think that we're really strong in the messaging um, that we're, we're trying to say. Like, we're walking the walk. You can tell it's authentic messaging. And that really comes through to consumers. I know like our our short term, our year ethos is celebration, which is very broad and, you know, has a lot of meanings to a lot of people. We're all like trying to celebrate in any way possible, especially it's been a few hard years. Um, yeah, not, I would say so. Always, just in general, not even necessarily business wise, just it's it's been challenging. So we want to make sure that as, you know, humans ourselves, we're out celebrating. Yeah, of course. And, and I think you're right that it goes beyond um, business, and I think we're still probably still going through challenging times. But COVID is 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 an example we we probably don't ever want to talk about again. But <laughs> has brought this about of enjoying the small moments, and and I think that's really affected this industry and people appreciating spirits, appreciating what um, you know what uh, uh, being able to invest more. In, in, in spirits that deliver flavor and that there's perhaps a new appreciation for um, what you do um, in creating that flavor palette um, through taste. Let's go back to to Freeland in terms of its, its business and its model. It's quite small batch, artisanal. How does that play a part in its appealing market? I think people are always looking for interesting new products. And especially in the Portland community, we have access to some great distilleries. Um, so having something that is small and well crafted and, you know, made by hand, like that kind of power in a product really shows through. It shines. Um, and being able to highlight local ingredients as well. Um, even for people who are not here, right? You get a sense that you're tasting Portland. That you're tasting the the whole of Oregon, the whole state, and that kind of time and place that you can put into a product when you're really hands-on and diving into cucumber varietals and what cucumber has the best flavor possibility, and then incorporating that into a product, really, it's art. It's definitely art. I mean, we've mentioned cucumber a little bit, so um, <laughs> I feel like we need to 
go back to go forward here, you, I mean, to remind um, some of our listeners that may not be so familiar with Freeland Spirits, you launched in 2017. So it's, it's, it's still a nascent brand, but you have come a long way in those last six or seven years, I would say. You have started with your first flagship gin, as you said. Um, you have now released Forest Gin, amongst other varietals, like you mentioned. Um, let's come back to the cucumber because that sounds interesting. Um, you've released a dry gin. You've now released a bourbon. You, We've had some RTD cocktails, which is a theme that this industry is talking about forever. <laughs> and and um, it's becoming an epic new development for a lot um, of consumers. Um, and now... I, if I'm correct, you've just bottled your first batch of rye whiskey. Is that correct? Yes. Is that correct? So yeah. that's a lot of work, Molly. Yeah. <laughs> that's and, a lot of six or seven years. It seems like a you know long amount of time, but not really when you think of it in terms of timeline for products. Yeah. But I mean, what's the inspiration behind it? How did, I guess, what was it led by? Was it led by commercial demand was it led by staying relevant to certain audiences or is it more and i feel like this may be a biased question for you is it more about the flavor chemistry and um and the, the exploration and experimenting what comes first you know that is an interesting question because i feel like it's very circular <laughs> um and that there's like so many different factors that go into like why are we doing this um and while like I am a creator and I take a lot of passion in the chemistry and all that behind it, I'm also still a partner and we have to release something that people are going to enjoy, right? That It's not like it has to be good. It, it just, it has to be good. And we want to make something that's delightful and people really get to enjoy. So that's always kind of the starting point, right? And then you think, and why do people enjoy what they do? And that's a whole fascinating subject in itself. But usually that's kind of where we start, where we're, we're thinking like, okay, so we have we want to make something else right what is that what are people gonna like and sometimes that leads to discussion and sometimes it is we had an idea for a product does it make sense um a great example for that is i have you know con my mind kind of constantly is working to make something right i just the life of a creator you're always kind of in that creation mode you can't turn your brain off. And it's a, a blessing and a curse at the same time. And so I was, you know, taking a shower. And all of a sudden, I was like, you know, what would be really fun to make is something with cherry blossom. And I was like, what, what would you make with that? And it came like a liqueur that would be really delicious and light and floral and a little sweet and a great way to incorporate cherry blossom and have it be really well highlighted. And so that kind of led this path where, you know, I brought it up to, to Jill She's like, that sounds great. How do we, how do we do this? And I was like, I'm not sure yet. Let me think about it. <laughs> and, and so then it was like, okay, so how do we bring this to life? And what makes sense? And sometimes that's where products die because you just can't bring them to life the way you want to. Mm -hmm. And we ended up being able to partner with the Japanese, um, Portland Japanese Gardens to collect cherry blossoms as they fell. Uh, when, wow. you know, it was springtime in Portland and it was just like this weird kind of connection between industries where like we pitch this to them they're like we love it let's do it and so we were able to work together to make this beautiful product and then you know knew that we were going to do it and had some months leading up to the actual project happening where you, i got to dive into the chemistry behind a cherry blossom and how to really highlight that ingredient and what else to maybe incorporate with that just to maybe pull on some different um intensities and so for me, it was a lot of fun just to be like, okay, this is something that like started in my head and it made sense. In the shower. Think people like it. <laughs> of course, everyone has the best shots, their best spots yeah. there. I, um, I mean, that's a podcast also in itself. <laughs> right. I don't think there was a shower beer involved, but maybe. <laughs> and um, you just realize that there are like all these layers to put in. We had this whole discussion. Do you think people will like this? And we're like, yes, because this is spring, right? Like this is, I, I, you you can relate in, um, in Scotland, it's rainy and it's dark and you go through a very like long four month period of rainy dark and then it's suddenly spring and you're like, I can, I can breathe again. And that's what the, we want this product to 
tell people like this is spring we're coming alive and like it looks back to that celebration <laughs> it, exactly. i was gonna say it, celebrating that the light is out and all is well once again um, exactly i i like that and that and i think so there is that exploration and and i guess the the amount of work that you build to build that extra taste no matter what there's always an element of risk in that isn't there so does that where it, it is that where it becomes almost an advantage that you are a small batch? Does it allow you to be a lot more experimental? I think so, because our batches we're producing are very small. We can sell sell them pretty quickly. Um, and so we get to see if people really respond to a flavor and maybe want to do like a secondary release. Like for this, you know, a lot of limited time offers that we have done before are just a one and done. And Cherry Blossom is going to live on another year. Um, but do, doing that kind of program for just small creative projects means that we can just kind of test things out and see where people really gravitate. And then of course we have our flagship where, you know, they're, they're always there. They're always massively able to find in 20 States. And, um, that's, that's all other challenge. Totally. Totally. And, and talking about the flagship bottle, I mean, Freeland Spirit started with the beautiful, voluptuous, curvaceous blue bottle. Mm -hmm. um, we have to talk about this. But before we do, a lot of the listeners may be thinking or thinking of launching their new um, product or have launched and looking to expand and putting that effort into building a custom design bottle. What embellishments do I use? Labels. It's a world of choice. Um, but it feels for some people perhaps a, an expense they can't justify. Um, why did Freeland feel like this was a valuable thing to invest in? Well, it was this long-term discussion. And one of the things that like very much drew me to Jill as well, and uh, maybe want to partner uh, with her and with Freeland, is the importance of branding, right? Um, I, we were around 20, 2008, there was a lot of different distilleries in the United States that started popping up, craft distilleries. And at that time, there was kind of a mixed bag of well-branded or stuff that was just maybe good, but not the branding wasn't the best. And that was okay for a while, where you could just be a good product. And if the branding wasn't great, people could still find you, gravitate. There weren't that many items on the shelf. And of course, when we started in 2017, that wasn't true any longer. So there was a lot of different bottles on the shelf, a lot of different choices a customer can make. And so your challenge with starting a brand is making sure that you stand out. And for us, we knew what we wanted to be. We knew we wanted to be women owned and operated. We wanted to be able to have a bottle that could help to tell that story. Uh, when we weren't there to tell it ourselves in a liquor store, because you get to a certain size, you, you're not going to be at every liquor store tasting. That's just the reality. And so you're not hand selling. You're looking for a package that really can do the selling for you. And so... Jill really had the idea to start with a custom bottle and to start really strong with a brand. And something that I, when she showed me for the first time, the mock-up for the bottle, I was like, yep, you, you know what you're doing. And it was this beautiful blue curvy bottle. We talked about some of the significance behind um, like the shape and the branding, all that went, that went into it. And it's very intentional. Um, the shape comes from two different sources of inspiration, one being the rain, which we talked about in such a dreary way, but it also gives us great agricultural abundance. So it, there, there's a trade-off. It's a great one. Um, we still have to complain about it, though. <laughs> yeah, of course. It's a conversation starter, after all. Exactly. <laughs> Especially the, amongst us Brits. <laughs> right. The second part of that was um, the Teardrop Lounge, which is an iconic cocktail lounge in Portland. And when Jill was first starting her journey into making a distillery, you know, it, it's a very niche world where there's not maybe a lot of people to talk to, not a lot of people who want to talk to you and um, or like share advice and go back and forth. You know, it's very like it's still a competitive industry. And so when she was kind of thinking about this, she would go to the cocktail lounge and um, just started making friends with the owner. And he was such a wealth of knowledge. So warm and inviting and just willing to kind of take her under his wing that, you know, she really enjoyed that, appreciated it and felt like she had kind of an advocate in the industry. 
And so two nods for the bottle. Um, and really just kind of from the beginning, just that really intentional we're we know we're not going to always be there to hand sell. We know that at the end of the day, branding, marketing, all that matters. And now we have a one two punch of an excellent bottle and an excellent product. Yeah. And it, and an excellent story behind that. I mean, I think that's, um, you know, something we're really passionate about is it's not just about aesthetic and standing out with with color and, and material. It's it's how it reflects you as a brand, because your story is so integral to you. And no one else is going to be doing a nod to Teardrop Lounge in Portland because none of them have gone there and, and, and talked to the manager and benefited from that one exchange and experience so many years ago that's led to such great things as a result. And that uniqueness is so important, I think. Um, and, and the fact that that's just hidden in the depths of, your, of the shape of your bottle is pretty special, I think. There are other details, though, on the, on the bottle. So it's an embossed bottle, a glass bottle, and there happens to be a beautiful woman on, 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 the, on the bottle holding a, a, a grape uh, of some description. Am I right? Yes. Yeah, I think it's supposed to be. It kind of looks like wheat to me. It could be rye. I don't know. It, it's a, <laughs> Well, the yeah. details. <laughs> yeah. We're, we don't worry about that too much. Um, but yeah, so... Um, it comes back to our, this is where we have a lot of layers, a lot of stories to tell. It's something that we very much enjoy um, being able to share, you know, our foundation. And one of those important parts is our namesake, right? Freeland came from somewhere and it came from Mima Freeland, which is in the South, what you call grandmas, Mimas. Um, oh, I'm I love from Oregon. That. It's really cute. I'm from Oregon and I had never really heard that very much. And then when I met Jill and she was telling me the name, because obviously that comes up. She told me it was from her Mima Freeland, who at the at her time was a breadwinner, which is very unusual for her time. And she was this really strong, powerful woman who um, taught Jill a lot of life lessons about how women can be whatever they want to be and that good things come from the earth. And we very much feel like we represent both of those things. And so it was obvious obvious namesake for the company that jill was starting and um we like to think that the woman on the bottle is uh mima not held down by the patriarchy just free and and embracing um femininity power all those things that's amazing and it's still and now through the spirit of the spirit um she's still doing the same thing i like it the only thing that's very funny about that, and we think Nemo would still be proud, but she was a teetotaler. <laughs> she did not, really? not, uh, not once did she drop, did she uh, drink alcohol. It was a funny bonding moment for Jill and I because both of our grandmas were, very, were teetotalers and we're like, I think they'd be proud. They're not with us anymore, but we think they'd be proud. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I think you'll get away with it. I think, yeah. I think that's all right. Um, but you mentioned earlier that it was it was Jill who kind of pr presented the design and and um, really got immediate buy in. But how did she go about approaching it? Because I think this is quite an intimidating step. Like you have maybe a vision, um, and and then what? How do you make that reality? Um, and and what was the process? Do you know how, what the process was for Jill? How did she go about it? I think Jill did a. A couple of smart things because you know her background is um she was an executive director for a nonprofit uh, for a few different ones and so like that her background is kind of a leadership uh role which is great but not necessarily suitable for like individually taking on all the branding for a project you want to work on like she had a very strong idea she you know maybe didn't have exactly the execution or didn't or really wanted to work with someone who was more of an expert in that so she ended up working with a company who um, helped to produce this image and to really make what she had in her head come to life. I think that's important, you know, to know your own limitations as a business owner. For one, in the long run, it does potentially save you money, but also saves you the headache from maybe not actually using the skills you specialize in. Yeah, absolutely. And there are p people who are able to extract that, that vision and, and turn that into something not only that looks good, that that actually is fit for manufacture so you, you exactly. can produce this <laughs> um 
Um, there are so and- many different things you have to look to when you're actually producing a bottle because it can't just be pretty, right? It has to also be functional and that's all and labels and all the requirements for labels and all those different things. Like it, it's nice to start on a pathway to success versus like trying to figure it out yourself, maybe getting there, but maybe having to, you know, hopefully not recall something, but you never know. It's a whole new world. It's a whole new world. But as, uh, as ever, as you start to release new bottles, you learn the tricks of the trade. It starts to become more instinctive. Um, but what I love about Freeland Spirits is that as you've developed out your portfolio, there is a there is a, a single line of consistency that that brings it all together. There's a cohesiveness, um, and that recognition is really important when it comes to a brand. Um, and you've done you've done that very well. Thank you. Um, I mean, I know we've gone back to it being a quite small business, so I can imagine it, it's quite hands on on site. Um, whether that's you know to you getting in touch with the flavors, really start to speak to those cucumbers and 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 honing in on that flavor into the taste, but down to, you know, bottling and and applying these different labels. In fact, the, the glass bottle that you have is a, is a simple um, a label that's applied. How, how do you go about quality checking that? How do you go about applying that onto bottle? I can, is, it, is it hand? I can imagine it's hand applied. It is, everything is hand applied. Um, so we, I mean, we have a few people in production. We bring in a bottling team when we're bottling and it is a very hands-on process. It's, um, you get very familiar, um, with like every way a a label could potentially fit on the bottle. What's the right way? What's the wrong way? You are so familiar with all the little nooks and crannies and what to look for. Um, you know, it's part of the QC process that is really important because you know you want cosmetically your bottle to look good like how it's supposed to on a shelf and there are just you know so many things to look for where they could differ they deviate enough and you're like this actually doesn't work for what we're trying to achieve anymore yeah absolutely but i guess being so intrinsically involved you get to spot their spot them on site in person before that that gets gets through the door and and out in market Speaking of markets, what does that look like for Freeland Spirits? Is it is it predominantly something that relies on online retailers or are you physically distributed in stores or is there a balance of two? How does how does it work for, for you guys? It's a, a balance of both. Um, we do some DTC direct to consumer sales. Um, you can find us um, on our website. You can kind of get directed to where that, that happens. Um, and then we're also available in different in about 20 different states. Um, so with most states, that means working with a distributor and then they you know, have their on and off premise and like states like Oregon, where it's a control state, that's a whole different kind of set of rules that you have to follow. And it's nice for us because, you know, we're here and we can self-distribute to the OLCC, um, our liquor control. And, um, then they kind of supply liquor, liquor stores, but we have like intrinsically boots on the ground. And obviously we've started a new year, 2024. Is there any insider secrets that you can share of what we should <laughs> expect from from Freeland? I I think we're going to be able to find us in more places, which is awesome. We're, we'll be adding a Excellent. few more states. Um, no international yet, but you know it's it's our goal. It's always been our goal to be. Um, I, I I jokingly at the beginning we said world domination, uh, <laughs> and we're going to we'll get there one day. It's just yeah. always you know. We never really had a timeline on it. Uh, maybe by a 10 year, who knows? Um, but we're slowly getting there. We're growing in a way that makes sense for us. But you definitely get to see a, a few more places. Um, and then we are get to look for cherry blossom liqueur, of course. That's going to be a fun one. And um, we're going to have um, a really big Women's History Month this this year. So that's um, March. Uh, March is an excellent time for us to highlight um, not just ourselves and our work, but the work of others. And so we're really excited for, for that coming up. Well, we'll make sure that anything that you can get involved in as, as listeners, if you are in the area, that will absolutely um, put a little link in the attached for you all to find out more. I mean, you answered my question in terms of you have done a lot in a little amount of time. In my, my perspective, from six to seven years, you have commanded a lot of attention which is fantastic for a small business um what and in the 
I mean, I was going to ask what the ultimate ambition is, but you've already answered with world domination. <laughs> of course, yeah. Ultimate goal. <laughs> but I, I guess in all reality, that is, you are hoping to scale internationally and um, and to, to appeal to us in Europe, which I think should oh, be yeah. your priority area. And <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, that's really exciting. And as you said, there's no timeline on that, um, but that's where your goal is ultimately in. Uh, and Molly, do you feel like Freeland Spirits is um, is your home? Yeah, I think it's um, one of those kind of one once in a lifetime projects, right? Um, when I, you know, first was chewing on if this role made sense for me, um, it was pretty quick chewing. Like I, I pretty clearly was like, this is this is a chance to really make products that. I get to explore deeply and passionately and start from the scratch. Um, and then from there it was like, that's an obvious, any, any creator would kill for a project like that. And then the other part of it was to highlight women in our, in our industry and, and the industries and in, in the industries that we touch and um, really be something that people can believe in. Um, and those opportunities are even rare. And it is actually just highlights this, um, idea of maybe ultimately at some point in the future, it would be good to be able to measure the impact that you're having in in the social aspect of things as opposed as as opposed to just the finance, although the finance is very important. Of what impact you're actually having in the community around you and the the distributors, and that's pretty powerful stuff. Um, one final question before I let you go and start your busy day ahead. Um, <laughs> If you were to encapsulate Freeland Spirits in one word or phrase, what would it be? Ooh. I know. We love this I, question at Signet. I asked I, I have to go back to the theme for 2024, which is a celebration. Um, I think it's something that we're all really creating and uh, not just celebrating who we are, but celebrating moments in time. And that's really powerful, you know, um, for us that that has a lot of different depths and layers. So there's layers all around Freeland and what we what we stand for. But at the end of the day, we we're about celebration. Thank you, Molly. Thank you for the time you've given us uh, today, and thank you for the contributions you've made to um, the people who are listening and will continue to listen in future. But mostly, thank you for creating this supportive network around you in Portland in the industry. Um, I hope and feel encouraged um, by that work uh, of you and Jill. And I look forward to seeing where Freeland Spirits gets to, particularly if it comes to the UK and I can buy it. <laughs> um, that would One be day. delightful. One day it will happen yeah, because world will. domination <laughs> is our ultimate ambition. That's right. Well, <laughs> thank you, Molly. And please share our thanks with Jill as well for what she's, um, she's leading over there. Uh, really appreciate your time. Thank you again. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.